All right, we are on. Welcome, everybody. If everything's coming through nice and clear, please let me know in the chat. Very much appreciate that. All right, I'm going to just take this quick link and put it up on Facebook quick. Just to let everybody else know that we are live. Right. Welcome. All right, we're going to wait about uh, two or three more minutes here, and then we are going to jump into this planetarium show with a nice quick tour of the sky. Let's see, down in the chat, what is your favorite star? My favorite star is probably Zubin el Ganubi, just because it's probably the most fun one to say. And in just a moment, I will introduce the people that I have with me. Vega is a great favorite star. All right, Kate, you're going to have to come out here so I can introduce you. All right, so we're just going to go ahead and get started with introductions to get that out of the way. Uh, for everybody who may not know me, my name is Adam McCulloch. I work here at Glass Education. Uh, doing a lot of the planetarium shows, organizing star parties, and a lot of stuff in between. And since we obviously can't cram everybody into an inflatable dome right now, uh, we decided that we wanted to offer something else so that people could uh, experience a tour of the night sky and do something really cool, especially since we had this remote telescope that we can use for observing. Uh, and with that, I want to introduce the president of Glass Education, Kate Meredith, so if you want to come around, you can lean into the camera. Say hello to everybody. Okay, hello everyone. Um, I'm Kate Meredith, and I am the president of Geneva Lake Astrophysics and STEAM, and I am really glad I'm not in charge tonight. <laughs> yeah, so Kate is running uh, support for me tonight in case something goes drastically wrong. She's always the person you want to have your back in case things go wrong. Also on with me tonight is our professional astrophysicist. Uh, within the next 10 years, I guarantee world-renowned astrophysicist, Katya Gosman, who I'm currently listening to through Zoom. So she's gonna let me know if I mess up or say something way off base. She's also gonna be monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions, throw them in there and she will answer them as we go throughout the show. And she'll let me know if there's anything that I can jump in and answer in a long rambling story that she can't uh, put in there nice and neat in the chat. But keep the chat going throughout. We love hearing your guys' comments. And 11.05. So I think we are just going to go ahead and jump right in.
So to start out, we just open Stellarium. So for those of you who are not familiar, Stellarium is a really great resource. It's something that you can download onto your computer. Uh, it's absolutely free and it can simulate the entire night sky. You can go to any location, any time of day. So the first thing you always want to do is when you go in, select your location. Now, I believe this has my location saved from when I did this earlier, but a cool thing is that Yerkes Observatory is actually an option you can select here. And since we're just down the road, might as well just select Yerkes. Now, one thing I also want to mention is that the uh, telescope that we're gonna be observing with later tonight is actually not here in Wisconsin. Uh, it's actually all the way in California, which is part of why we are starting so late at night because it is only 9 p.m. there and still not quite dark enough uh, to observe well with that telescope. So the first part of the show is going to be all here on Stellarium. So we're actually gonna take and set the time to be 9.30 because that's essentially what it looks like in California right now is what our sky looked like around 9.30. We'll even go to 9.45 just so we have a nice dark night sky. This also means that tomorrow when you go out at 9.30, so you don't have to stay up quite as late as you're staying up tonight, you can go out and look for all of the uh, different things that we're going to talk about today. So to start, we're just going to kind of zoom around, take a look through. Stellarium is really cool because it highlights a bunch of the really bright stars. So for somebody, the, whoever said their favorite star is Vega, coming up in the northeast. Oh, hello, Sarah. Uh, sorry, uh, so there's Vega coming up in the northeast, and as we wheel around, there's north. Over here to the west, uh, we still got a bunch of bright stars and even a planet off in the distance. So now the first thing you want to do when you go outside at night is be able to figure out where you're looking. One thing we have the advantage of here in Stellarium is, as you can see, we have these very nice cardinal directions. But when you go outside at night, unfortunately, there won't be big red magic letters in the sky telling you what direction you're facing. Uh, so I'm going to teach you a trick so that you can go out and figure out where you're looking uh, no matter what time of year or time of night you go outside. And the first thing you should always go and look for if you're in the northern hemisphere, especially if you're as far north as Wisconsin, is to look for the Big Dipper. Uh, I apologize if that got a little crazy for a second there. So as I mentioned, the Big Dipper, something you always want to find, and one thing that we can focus on pretty easily. And so here we have the Big Dipper. So if you follow along with how, as I highlight the stars, there are seven stars in the Big Dipper, and they all follow along there in that pattern. And so we're going to turn those lines on. Now, one thing you might notice is that there's a bunch of weird lines coming off of the Big Dipper. And that has to do with the fact that the Big Dipper is actually not a constellation. The Big Dipper is actually what we call an asterism meaning it's part of a larger constellation that looks like something completely different. So really the Big Dipper is just kind of the body and tail of Ursa Major or the Big Bear. So it's always kind of fun to bring the, night, the big picture up uh, because constellations, especially the lines, don't always look like what they're supposed to, uh, at least not in my opinion. Some are better than others. Ursa Major is okay, uh, but really we care more just about the big, uh, the big Dipper itself. So we're gonna zoom in a little bit on the Big Dipper. Now, there are a couple reasons that you always wanna find the Big Dipper first. Uh, the biggest one being that six of those seven stars, uh, with the exception being the one here in the handle, Megra is not, not that bright of a star, but the rest of those uh, six are actually fairly bright stars, making the Big Dipper very easy to find even if you have a decent amount of light pollution in your sky. Uh, I lived in Milwaukee for almost a year and the Big Dipper was actually still visible even though 
almost nothing else other than the brightest stars was actually visible from the skies of Milwaukee. Here in Williams Bay, uh, the Big Dipper is very easy to pick out. And the nice thing about the spring and early summer is that when you start out early in the night, the Big Dipper is very, very high in the sky, making it that much better to find first. Another really good reason to find the Big Dipper is because you can actually use it to find something else that is very, very important. So if you take Mirac here and Dupe, and if you kind of connect the line, like the yellow one there that connects those two, and you kind of extend that line down, you'll eventually hit a bright star named Polaris. Now, if you don't know the name Polaris, that's okay. You probably have heard of this star though, because another name for this star is the North Star. And Polaris is the North Star because Earth's axis points straight at it, and so as the Earth turns and we go through night and day, everything in our night sky appears to spin around Polaris. But we'll get into that a little bit later. Right now I just want to talk about how uh, a lot of people tend to think that Polaris in the North Star is one of the brightest stars in the sky and how you can go outside at night and you just look for the brightest star in the sky and you know that you're facing north. If you try that method, you will more than likely end up facing south and it's not gonna be very helpful to you. Nothing will be where you expect it and more often than not, you'll be looking at a planet. So you wanna go and find the Big Dipper first and then use that to make sure that you're actually looking at Polaris. Now, another nice thing about finding Polaris is that it's also part of a constellation because Polaris is the tip of the handle of the Little Dipper. Now, if the Big Dipper is part of the Big Bear, it makes sense that the Little Dipper also happens to be part of Ursa Minor or the Little Bear. Now, one thing you might notice is a little odd about these two bears is they kind of have some long tails. We don't normally picture bears walking around wagging long tails, and for good reason. These two bears, however, have long tails due to how, this, how they supposedly got into the night sky. And this goes back to the Greek mythology uh, where it was Zeus who actually grabbed these two bears by the tail, swung them around over his head, and he swung them so fast that their tails stretched out, and when he let go, they went flying all the way up and got stuck in the night sky and have stayed there ever since. Now, there are a lot of stories that involve uh, these two groups of stars. Uh, many cultures, uh, like in the UK, the Big Dipper is actually usually referred to as the plow. In ancient Chinese astronomy, it's uh, sometimes referred to as the government, the seven stars of the Big Dipper. And even during the 1800s here in the United States, the Big Dipper was known as the, uh, the drinking gourd by runaway slaves. And there were actually folk songs written to tell people to follow the drinking gourd to freedom because a lot of slaves at the time were illiterate, but they were able to remember songs. And so the songs were written to tell them basically how to escape and find a better place to live in the North. So these two constellations have been used by many different cultures in many different ways. But one very interesting thing is that there are multiple different Native American uh, nations that use, uh, that have stories with these constellations relating to bears. So just as the Greek mythology of these two constellations is about two bears, uh, there are multiple different stories that involve these stars representing the same animals, even though these two cultures uh, never actually interacted and lived quite a ways away from each other. Now I want to talk about one more constellation that's kind of up here in the north. Uh, so as I mentioned, Polaris stays in the same spot all night long. Uh, and another great thing about the Big Dipper is that it's also always up in the sky, but it doesn't stay in the same spot the entire night. And I mentioned how in the spring and early summer, it's great because at the beginning of the night, the Big Dipper is very high in the sky, almost directly overhead. Well, during obviously the late fall, early winter, it's the opposite. So the Big Dipper is kind of low. 
So if you have trees to the north of your house when you're outside looking, you might actually miss the Big Dipper. And so then you might feel a little lost because you can't find the most recognizable uh, pattern in the sky. But if you look down here, you'll notice there's another pattern of stars, part of the constellation Cassiopeia. Now I'll take the drawing away and we'll focus in on Cassiopeia. Now Cassiopeia, you may have also just heard referred to as the W. Cassiopeia is great because it's also uh, consisted of multiple bright stars and a very easily recognized pattern. And the main reason I point out Cassiopeia is that, as you notice, Cassiopeia is very low in the sky, so it wouldn't be the best one to go and look for tonight. But if you notice, the middle star here in the Big Dipper, Polaris, oh, wrong way, and then down here in Cassiopeia, Cassiopeia is on the exact opposite side of Polaris from the Big Dipper. So if one of them is low in the sky, it means the other one is very high in the sky. So you can always find at least one of the two, and the W opens up in the direction of Ursa Minor and Ursa Major. So while there isn't a great two-star alignment that helps you point straight to where you want to look, you can still use it to effectively figure out the, t the area of the sky that you want to look in. So these are the... And so these are uh, kind of the three main constellations in the northern part of the sky. So we already pointed out that uh, you can use the Big Dipper to find arguably the most important thing to find in the night sky when you're trying to orient yourself in Polaris. But also during the spring and summer, you can use the Big Dipper to find another very useful star. So if we bring it around over here, so we use the right side of the cup of the Big Dipper before. Now what we're going to use is the handle. So if you take the handle and you follow it along, you kind of arc along with the handle until you reach a star named Arcturus. Now Arcturus is part of the constellation Bootes. Uh, Bootes is Kind of a fun constellation in that there's an asterism here. So just as the Big Dipper is only part of Ursa Major, Bootes also has something hidden in it as well. So if you take the two stars here and here, so Theba and this one, one of the uh, fainter Bootes stars, and you connect them, you can kind of picture the lower part as a kind of a lopsided triangle or as an uh, you can kind of picture it as a waffle cone, and on the top you have a big chunk of ice cream, and it's actually the ice cream cone asterism. And how fitting that we have a nice ice cream cone up in the sky during the summer to help cool us down at night. Now another thing that you can do is once you've found Arcturus from arcing from the Big Dipper, you can actually then also spike to Spica, which is in a constellation Virgo. Now Virgo is also a very important constellation because Virgo was used in Greek mythology to signify the beginning and end of the fall and uh, so the beginning of fall and the beginning of spring or the end of winter. Uh, Virgo is usually behind the sun during our winter and they believed that when Virgo is down below the horizon after sunset, that was when the ancient god whose name, I believe Persephone, was trapped in Hades, uh, ha trapped in the underworld with Hades, and so that meant that she wasn't there to bring life to the land, so everything kind of turned gray, turned brown and died, so representing winter, and then when she came back up into the sky in the spring, all of the life started to return back to the land because she was returning from the underworld. Now I want to talk about a couple other constellations up here in the sky. One of the ones I want to talk about has to do with this star here named Regulus. 
Now, if you follow some of the bright stars above Regulus, and you keep going all the way around this shape, you end up with what looks like a backwards question mark. And so looking for more familiar shapes is a great way in finding pieces of constellations to help you locate them. So this backwards question mark helps you find the constellation Leo. And in case it's not obvious by the name, Leo is of course a lion. And so the question, backwards question mark is actually his head and mane. And Regulus being the brightest star in Leo is also a very good star to find in the late spring, early summer, as it's a nice bright one. And Leo is a fun constellation to find because I find the backwards question mark to be uh, very, very useful when orienting yourself at night. Now we're going to zoom out a little bit here. And I want to talk about some of the constellations that are just now fading from the sky. So if I took, take uh, the cardinal directions and put those back on, you can see that we're facing west. And there are a bunch of bright stars over there to the west. Over here, of course, we have Venus, currently in the constellation Taurus, which is now just below the horizon, so you don't really get a good look at Taurus. The cool thing that we can do in here is get a much closer look at Venus. So you actually don't even need a very large telescope to go out and look at Venus at night. And it's very easy to find as it will basically look like the brightest star in the night sky. But when you get a closer look at Venus, you can see that it actually isn't a full circle. Venus actually goes through phases just like our moon. And this, uh, these phases was proof that Venus is closer to the sun and that both Earth and Venus orbit around the sun. It was one of the first uh, things used to prove the heliocentric model. One of the other proofs was Jupiter and its moons, and if you tune in for one of the shows this summer, we'll definitely be able to take a close look at those. Now we're going to zoom back out a bit. So I want to talk about some of the other things that are up here in the sky. Now here's one that most people probably recognize. Betelgeuse. Now, unfortunately, the constellation Orion, in which Beetle, where you can find Betelgeuse, is starting to go below the horizon at this time of the time of the year, uh, just early in the night. So you can't really go out and find the belt too easily anymore. Uh, one of the great things about Stellarium, though, is that when the ground gets in the way, we can just get rid of it. So we don't have to worry about our view being obstructed by anything. So now we can look at the entire constellation of Orion. And don't worry, I won't say the name of the star anymore. So we're just gonna leave it at the two times that I said it. Now the left shoulder is a star named Bellatrix. And for any Harry Potter fans out there, if you look over here to the left, this just so happens to be the brightest star in our entire night sky, Sirius. And so Sirius and Bellatrix, and if you remember back when we were looking at Leo, the star Regulus, are all different characters of the, in the same family in Harry Potter. Uh, so I always like pointing that out because I'm a big Harry Potter fan. So I hope some of you are too. But we're gonna put the ground back because it helps uh, keep a good idea of where you're looking in the sky. Now, one constellation that I want to point out, just because it's one of my uh, absolute favorite stories, is Cancer the Crab. And the reason I like Cancer is because there's, because according to Greek mythology, the story in which he got into the sky is actually, uh, to me, quite funny. So if you're not familiar with Hercules, who was an ancient Greek hero, he was tasked with completing some of these, uh, what were seen to be un insurmountable tasks. One of them was fighting Hydra, the multi-headed dragon. And while he was going through this difficult fight, he happened to step a little bit too close to a crab that was minding its own business. And the crab got scared, and so it pinched him on the foot. 
And Hera, who was the wife of Zeus, uh, did not care for Hercules very much. In fact, you could probably say that she hated him. And so while she was fight watching this fight, she thought that it was so funny the crab pinched Hercules on the foot, she decided to put the crab into the night sky forever. And that is why, even to this day, we have a crab named Cancer in our night sky. Though he did not complete any heroic tasks himself, just pinched a hero on the foot to the delight of one of the Greek gods. Now there's one more constellation that I would like, uh, there's two more actually I'd like to point out. So one of the other constellations that I wanted to point out, just because I think it's kind of fun to mention, not a lot of people are aware that there is a unicorn in our night sky. Monoceros is the unicorn. Uh, not a very easy constellation to find as the stars in Monoceros are not very bright. And as you can tell by the pattern, uh, not the closest to looking what it's supposed to. But now we're going to focus on the last constellation that I want to talk about because there's something kind of unique about this one. Coma Berenices. Now, Coma Berenices is interesting in that it's the only constellation in the sky named after somebody we know existed, as Berenices was actually an Egyptian princess who was said to have this beautiful long hair. And when her father and the uh, entire army went off to fight a war, she was so worried that she offered her beautiful hair in exchange for the safe return of her father, the pharaoh, and all of their army. And so the gods decided that this sacrifice was so selfless that they made sure that the pharaoh returned and in exchange took her hair and forever immortalized it in the night sky. So here in the sky you can go out and actually find Coma Berenices, named after the Egyptian princess. Now, we are going to talk Right. All right, so we are going to now focus on a little bit of the mechanics of our night sky. So we have talked about a bunch of the constellations, and while I know I don't expect anybody to just watch this and remember every single constellation I've pointed out, there are some really great free apps on your phone. Uh, Stellarium, also a really great free app for your computer. And if you have a Chromebook or a computer that doesn't have a lot of space on the hard drive, it's also something that you can uh, use in a browser. But we're gonna focus now on Polaris again, which got it on the first try. We are gonna turn the constellations on in that I want to have the Big Dipper on. And I also want to have Cassiopeia on. So now we can watch up here in the sky. I'm going to turn the drawings off. And we're going to move forward in time and watch how these constellations move through our sky. Now one problem I can already tell you we're probably gonna run into is the fact that when the sun comes up, we won't be able to see these constellations very well. So we're gonna solve that issue by taking away the atmosphere. So now when the sun does come up, uh, there's no air and atmosphere for the light to get scattered in and won't block any of the stars in the background. And as we start to move throughout the night, and you can watch the time at the lower end of the screen. So now we moved into the early morning of tomorrow. And Polaris, or the, kind of the tip of the hand, the little dipper staying in the same spot. And as you can see, the Big Dipper and Cassiopeia staying the same distance from each other, just moving in a circle around Polaris. And the screen is gonna get a little busy. But as you can see, now we can actually put uh, array and declination 
in the sky. And you can see how astronomers map things uh, where certain stars are, where certain objects are in our night sky. Now you can see that the sun is up because our uh, foreground is all lit up, but since there's no atmosphere, we don't have to worry about our sky disappearing. And now at this time of the year, you can see that as the sun is getting lower and lower, you can see that the Big Dipper is getting right back up to be high in the sky where we expected it, uh, where we first looked at it. As we are just now getting a little bit closer to a little before 9.30, we're gonna go a little later. So here we are. And so now when we move around the sky, you can see that in the north, where you can see full circles, Anything that's in a circle where you can see the entirety of the circle is what's called circumpolar, meaning that it never actually sets in our night sky. So Cassiopeia, uh, the Big and Little Dipper are all circumpolar. You can always go out and find them in the night sky here in Wisconsin. Now, if we look down to the south, you'll see that we don't see full segments of circles at all. What we see are just the lines going across the sky. And so that's why certain things rise and set at different times of the night, just like how Spica and Arcturus will uh, rose a little earlier. And if we even move back in time, you can kind of watch how our entire night sky moves. And there's the sun, of course, the brightest star in our sky. As much as I love the sun for the warmth it brings us, it's not my favorite when I'm trying to look at the stars. So one last time. We can actually zoom in a little bit on Polaris. One fun thing to note is that while Polaris, uh, well, we usually say Polaris doesn't move in our sky, that's actually not quite true. Uh, Polaris isn't exactly at the center of the pole, as you can see here. So over the course of a night, it actually makes a very small circle in our night sky. But because that circle is so small, we barely even notice it, effectively making it look like Polaris stays in the exact same spot. And the great thing is, for our entire lifetime, we can always count on Polaris being in that same spot throughout the entire night. Now, one thing I mentioned is that we're looking at right ascension and declination. Now, those names are not the most helpful to people that have never used them before. So a quick introduction. If you see the vertical lines that go and point to Polaris, so all of those vertical lines that go up and go towards Polaris, the closer you are on that vertical line to Polaris, it, that's it, and the farther away you go from Polaris, that is a change in declination. As you go around the circles, that is a change in right ascension. So most of the time, uh, almost all the time, everything has kind of the same declination because everything out in our sky is actually not moving. It's just us here on Earth spinning. And so really everything just appears to be moving because we can't feel the Earth moving at all. But everything changes its uh, position relative to us. So it kind of looks like the right ascension is changing as it moves along those lines. Ooh, one thing to note up here in the sky, Jupiter and Saturn. And since the sun isn't up, we can go take a look at Jupiter. As I mentioned, one of the other proofs, let's get that grid down, that we are not the center of our solar system was the fact that Jupiter has these four, the four Galilean moons that orbit around it. And so we're able to 
then use that as evidence to say that not everything in the solar system goes around the Earth, and then showing that Venus must orbit the Sun, and with uh, all of the other signs like how uh, Mars and Jupiter and Saturn make these fun little retrograde motions that kind of make little loops in the sky, we are able to prove that we are not the center in the fact that the Sun is. Now, uh, very soon we're going to be using the Stone Edge Observatory in Sonoma, California to actually take images of some objects out in the sky. So first I want to do, first thing I want to do is to point some out here on Stellarium before we go and find them. So if we're changing where we're viewing from, because now instead of looking from here in Wisconsin and Williams Bay, we're actually going to be looking from Sonoma, California. So Sonoma State Observatory will work just fine. Oh, did not let me. See. So we're going to move the sky. And now what we have to do is actually put the time to the right one. So today is the 24th. Oh, we went forward quite a few days. And we're going to go to about 9.37, because that is the time right now in Sonoma. There we go. So the first object we're going to look for is a galaxy named M51. So a lot of the objects I'm going to be talking about tonight uh, will have a, the letter M followed by a number. Uh, this is because they are part of what's called the Messier Catalog. If you're not familiar with the Messier Catalog, it has to go back to a, an astronomer by the name of Charles Messier, who was a very famous comet hunter. He wanted to find and chart comets more than anything else. And whenever he would go out and observe, he would find these faint objects in the sky that kind of resembled comets as they were faint and hard to find. And so when he would observe them for multiple nights and realize they weren't moving, he quickly realized that they were not comets, so he would mark them down. And he ended up making a list of about 110 objects, and it was essentially a list of objects that he didn't want to look at. And now today, it is the go-to amateur astronomer's list of objects to look at. So his uh, legacy is now more involved with the list of things he didn't want to see. But for us, it works great because the Messier catalog is full of bright, amazing objects. And Stellarium quit on me. So we're going to uh, hold on one second while we reopen that. And get that going again. Awesome, so we are ready to go at the Stone Edge Observatory. So we're just gonna point out M51 here. Oh, that's the location. That's not what we want. And a great thing about Stellarium is it has all of the Messier catalog in here. So if you notice, M51 is very close to Ursa Major. M51 is very close to the handle. So now what we're going to do is switch screens. Oh no, we're upside down. There we go. <laughs> All right, and I'm also talking to Katya at the same time. So Katya, on the stream, do we look good? Am I, is it streaming the right screen now? Still see Stellarium. Sorry, Kate, you said you see it Somna? Yeah. Okay. 
All right, so we are good to go then. So the first thing that we want to do, this is Slack. So for those of you not familiar, Slack is just kind of a message, messaging system that companies use uh, for employees to interact. You can make different channels where you can uh, talk about different specific subjects. Well, a very smart engineer uh, designed Itzamna as an interface between Slack and the controls of this telescope. So all we have to do is send uh, messages through Slack to the telescope and Itzamna does the rest of the work for us. So the first thing that we want to do, and let me just check this with Katya, is we want to find M51, correct? So Itzamna is now searching, and of course it found it because that's a very easy one to find. And the next thing we're going to do is it's very important that we make sure that it's visible right now because the telescope can't point everywhere. And un unlike Stellarium, uh, the telescope is not capable of making the ground disappear and looking through it. So we have to make sure that whatever objects we're about to point at are up in the sky and high enough for the telescope to view. Uh, luckily, we already made sure that all of the objects we're going to be looking at are in such position. So we don't have to worry too much about this, but it's always good to double check because better safe than sorry. The next thing we want to do is pinpoint. And this is essentially going to take the telescope, point in the direction of the object using the right ascension and declination, take a short exposure, and then look at the stars from that exposure match it up to a database, and then realign the telescope to make sure that our object is exactly where we expect it to be. Now, unfortunately, this can end up taking a little bit. Uh, so now we're left with little time. So if there are any questions, how has the chat been going? Adam, the chat's been going really well tonight. And I really appreciated everyone that's been online. And being the president of Geneva Lake Astrophysics and Steam, I'm going to take this moment to thank you and also ask you to Check us out on Facebook and join our Tuesday, um, Giving Tuesday uh, campaign that we are starting launching now. And so keep an eye out for us. The official day is on May 5th. So we, and don't forget, you can write us a review because we just arrived on Google Maps this week. Steve says hi. All right, so Katya is currently working on putting together something really cool for us. Uh, one thing that I want to make clear is when you Google images of these objects that we're about to look up, you're going to find these wonderful, crystal clear, colorful images. Well, what we're taking images with is a CCD camera, and so we aren't going to get nice, colorful images. They're more for, collect they're for collecting data. And so when you see these colorful images, you're actually taking light from different wavelengths and then basically false coloring them and adding them together in order to create that colored image. So really, uh, we're only going to get something that's going to look black and white because we're only going to be looking at uh, collecting a certain uh, amount of data. So basically the amount of light that we're collecting. Uh, so one thing that we can do is take images using different filters. So a filter basically blocks out all light except for a specific kind that we want to get. And there are narrow bands and uh, broad bands. Broad bands basically say, I don't want to see anything other than kind of the 
green or the uh, the red light, or I don't want to see anything other than the blue light, or maybe I just want the middle of the visible spectrum. If you want a narrow band, that is when you take that when you say I want to catch this one very very narrow wavelength of light, so a very specific type of light. One of the very common ones is hydrogen alpha, uh, because in stars there is a specific energy trans uh, transfer in hydrogen atoms that it causes that type of light to emit. So especially when you're looking in nebula, whenever there's any kind of star forming region, H2 is really, really good to look for, and that shows up really well. And that light also tends to sometimes uh, get squashed out by other forms of light. So when you want to look at something very specific, you use kind of a narrow band filter. Uh, but we just want to look at the objects and appreciate how cool they are. So now we are successfully pinpointed. And so we are good to go. And we can do image 10, meaning uh, we want to take a 10 second exposure. So essentially we're going to open the camera up to the light for 10 seconds, collecting all of the data or the amount of light, the photons hitting that uh, chip in the camera. Binning of two. And I'm going to let people Google binning because I still am not good at explaining it. And we're going to use a clear filter. Meaning that we don't want to block any light out because we just want to get an idea for this galaxy. And one thing that I am pretty confident in is that this is a very easy, a very easy galaxy to spot. Because even uh, with a decently sized telescope, you can still find this galaxy with, the, with uh, just visually looking through. So when you're taking an image, you're definitely going to get more. Now, one thing I want to talk about, the telescope that we're operating is uh, a 20 inch telescope. So sometimes if you've ever been to one of our star parties or gone to a star parties, you'll probably see one of our eight inch doves. And those are really great telescopes because they're easy to move, easy to carry, and they're still pretty big. Uh, a 20 inch telescope is, as it sounds, quite a bit bigger. Uh, this telescope also has uh, a really good camera on it. So we're able to take some really cool images. And any second now, we should be getting back. image. Sometimes Exomna wants to just kind of wait a little bit. Ooh, um, we're going to share that. Oh yeah, can you post that in Exomna? Sorry, I'm talking to our professional astrophysicist Katya who put something cool together. And so she is going to post that here in this channel where we can all see it. Soon. We're going to scroll down to the bottom. Sometimes you just have to be patient. Uh, a big thing of an, in astronomy and observing is patience. Uh, so if you go into astronomy, whether you want to or not, you will learn to be a more patient person. Or you'll quit astronomy. And there we go. What a beautiful image. And so this was just opening up the CCD camera for 10 seconds and collecting light from this galaxy, which is millions of light years away. Now, one thing you might notice is you can actually see the big spiral arms coming out from the larger one. Down below, that is actually not a galaxy that's further off in the distance or nearby. That galaxy is actually trapped by the gravity of M51 or the Whirlpool galaxy. And so that uh, small galaxy is uh, will actually pass through the arms of the larger one and is completely trapped by its gravity. So they almost work 
as work together as one system. Now I am going to, let's take a little bit longer of an exposure. Just to grab one more picture. Let's go for a minute. And so now it's gonna take yet another one. And one thing I'd like to mention, uh, if you go to our website, glasseducation.org, there is a contact us section. If you want to sign up for our uh, emailing system, so you'll get notified anytime we do an event like this or any other kind of event we do in the future. Uh, if you go in there and add to the comments that you would like the JPEGs from the observing session, I will go back and save all of these images once they have been processed and look a lot nicer and we'll send those all out in a big email to you. So make sure uh, sometime tonight or tomorrow morning you guys go ahead and do that. Uh, and if you forget the directions, this video will actually be on YouTube tomorrow so you can go back to our channel, uh, go ahead and rewatch it just for fun because it's that great. And go ahead and look for all the little uh, details that you need to remember in order to get these JPEGs later on. And now you can actually see the difference in what 60 seconds actually does. How much more material you can actually pick up. So the fainter stuff becomes much more obvious. Now, as I mentioned before, these are only going to be black and white images. Um, one second before I get onto that, we're gonna go and find one other object quick, and then I'm gonna ask Katya to show us something cool. So our next galaxy is another Messier object, Messier 101, which is actually pretty close and nearby. And we're gonna plot it just to make sure. And yes, we are good to go. And so now we are going to go and point at Messier 101. And Katya is gonna share with us a picture that she made. So Katya, if you'd like to, please go ahead and post. So in 2017, Katya was actually actively using Stone Edge Observatory, and so she took some images of M51. As I mentioned, it's part of the Messier catalog, and these, these objects are some of the absolute best ones to go and look for. So naturally, Katya took images back then and was able to take uh, different exposures in different wavelengths and combine them to create a colored image. Right, so actually, uh, because the one of the handy things about having somebody as smart as Katya on board is she actually did this color combine uh, just a couple of minutes ago while I was wrapping up the planetarium show. So by taking a couple of other images and stacking them, you can see where different types of light are coming out of this galaxy. And so you can see all sorts of different uh, shapes in there you can see where there are kind of star forming regions going on in the spiral arms of this galaxy this is a really great picture and this was also one that i am more than happy to send out as a jpeg so go ahead uh, the other thing you can do if you can't if uh you don't want to go through the contact and sign up for the email list but you really really want these pictures uh, if you can just send an email with your name to contact at glasseducation.org, 
I will respond to all of those and get you guys back your images from tonight. So the one of the galaxies that we just looked at, uh, M51, this is what's called a grand spiral. The next one that we're going to be looking at is M101, also known as the pinwheel galaxy. And that one is also a grand spiral galaxy. And uh, one of the nice things about grand spirals is that the name is pretty self-explanatory. It just so happens that M51 is an interesting one and in that it actually has a trapped galaxy alongside it. And that that galaxy that it trapped is uh, of a very significant size relative to uh, the whirlpool itself. One thing that not many people are aware of is our Milky Way galaxy that we live inside actually has multiple galaxies orbiting it. These are called uh, dwarf galaxies or satellite galaxies and the large and small Magellanic clouds are their names. Unfortunately, from the northern hemisphere you are not able to view these Magellanic clouds and one uh, before I finish that, let's go ahead and do image and to and clear. So as I mentioned before, um, a lot of these colored images are usually false colored. Uh, so if you stack them differently, you can make them look a little bit different. So Katya was just telling me that uh, she also has a different combination of these galaxies that look just a little bit different, and she's going to post that one in this chat in just a second while we wait for our exposure of the pinwheel galaxy. And coming up, there is Cosmic K Dizzles. So this is a different stacking of M51. And wow, this is really cool. Look, you can see a lot of detail in the arms. Oh, that is really cool. Yeah, one other thing I should mention is that these images that we're getting back uh, as you can see, have quite a bit going on in the background. And the reason that the images Katya is posting don't have that is because uh, when you take images like this, you usually subtract certain things from the images when you're done. So the camera makes a noise whenever it's doing anything because electrons jump and there's heat produced in the camera. So you end up with little bits of data points that are actually nothing. And so sometimes you take images to uh, look at kind of an average and are able then to take that noise away, which is why the picture that Katya posts and the picture that we see here are quite different. So here we have the pinwheel galaxy, and I can see already that we need to take longer exposure. We're just going to go two minutes. But even here, in only a 10 second exposure, uh, we usually take 10 second exposures right away to ensure that the object we're trying to image is actually in the center of where the telescope is looking. So you can still see some detail of this galaxy. Uh, I think with the next image, we'll be able to pick out quite a bit more.
And so while we wait for that, I'm going to go take a look at the chat. Yes. Unfortunately, yeah, SEO is just camera. Um, uh, a good example, though, is you can actually put something on uh, telescopes of this size. Yes, as Katya just explained, the, the 24-inch at Yerkes uh, had a function where it could switch between the CCD camera and an actual eyepiece. Uh, I was lucky enough for the last couple months where you all your keys was open, I was giving tours on the 24 inch telescope. So we were able to take people up in the dome and actually look at things through the eyepiece. And then when it came to fainter galaxies and really cool things that are kind of hard to see if you don't have the perfect conditions, we were able to then just quickly switch over to the camera and take exposures kind of like what we're doing tonight. Uh, and if your keys just would, uh, be able to reopen is when your keys is able to reopen and they're able to put those telescopes back online you can actually control the 24 inch telescope remotely just like uh just like the seo but in a much different uh system And it's been kind of a long practice of people used to put uh, plate cameras on their telescopes and switch back and forth between eyepieces way back when astron a lot of astronomy was done optically. Uh, obviously before plate cameras or especially modern CCD cameras, all observation observational astronomy was just done visually. So people would go and look and draw and write things down. Uh, of course, Plate cameras were able to then help us make some pretty big advancements and then CCDs even more so. So now here we have a much better image of the pinwheel galaxy. So this is M101. As, as you can see, it has a couple more arms than uh, M51 does. Nice bright center, but kind of a smaller center. And this one is really nice because you are almost looking uh, straight on to kind of the top, kind of a top down view of this galaxy. So you really get an idea for how wide it is. Now, not all galaxies are oriented that way. We unfortunately don't always get that really cool view of looking at the structure of a galaxy uh, from the top or from the bottom. Sometimes, they are actually turned so we look at them edge on and looking at something edge on uh, from, that, from this far away can make them look quite different. So the next one we're gonna look at is Messier 82. Uh, this one is also known as the Cigar Galaxy. And, oh, we're hitting it almost right at the perfect time. So now another thing, uh, M82 uh, as I mentioned is the Cigar Galaxy. It is in the constellation Ursa Major. So um, all three of the ones we've looked at are very close to each other in the sky. And it just so happens that, that we're kind of, when you're looking in this area of the sky, you're kind of looking out of our galaxy, which then makes sense that when you're looking away from our galaxy, not looking into our spiral arms, you're able to see more galaxies because they're not obstructed by the material that makes up our galaxy. The next couple ones we're going to look at are a little bit different. And there are only two more, unfortunately, for tonight.
right. Thank you guys for joining us. Whoever was saying good night. Good night, David. All right, let's see. So as I mentioned, uh, astronomy, especially when you're controlling the telescope manually, is something you need quite a bit of patience for. Luckily, once you start to get into the night and you've started to take some images, as you wait for the next one, then you can start to play with the older images. So the look back at the wheel, this would be a really cool one to take a couple of exposures in narrow bands to try to actually pick out more detail in the arm. So we were thinking about every week we would focus on something a little different and I really wanted to start with galaxies because to be perfectly honest I really don't think there's anything cooler to look at uh, through a telescope than other galaxies. Being able to look at something uh, that's millions of light years away, so essentially the light you're seeing left that galaxy millions of years ago. And uh, you're basically then looking back millions of years in time, and it's almost kind of like uh, having your own little time machine. And so galaxies are really the coolest thing in my mind to look at through a telescope. But if I'd like to hear from you guys, uh, what else is really interesting to you? Uh, nebulas, clusters, uh, obviously planets are always fun to look at. Uh, asteroids are something that are very commonly looked at through, uh, uh, looked at, I should say, observed through telescopes like this. Comets are also very common. Uh, there was actually a comet recently that was uh, pretty bright and easy to find. I believe it was Comet Atlas. Uh, we actually, if you go to uh, Glass Education on Facebook uh, and you scroll down a couple of posts, we sent one out that a friend of Glass posted as he, well, we were doing our Messier Marathon with the Stone Edge Observatory. Uh, he was actually realized that there was a comet out and went and took images for us and sent them to us, which was really nice. And I just realized that I said Messier Marathon and not everybody might not uh, know what that is. So for those of you who have not heard of a Messier Marathon, uh, it actually is a little self-explanatory since I talked about what the Messier catalog is. It's basically trying to image or observe every single object in the Messier catalog over the course of one night. So if we think back to the planetarium, uh, if we notice that when we turn the atmosphere off, uh, the sun is always obstructing something in our sky because there's always going to be something that's going to be completely blocked out by the sun. Well, in late March and early April, there aren't any Messier objects directly by the, behind the sun or uh, within a couple of degrees of the sun. So you're able to actually observe all 110 objects in one night. Now, with the Stone Observatory, we did have some limitations. So we were not able to get all 110, but we did get quite a few off of the list and were able to make a pretty cool collection of images. And we are able to take over 200 images over the course of three nights. Uh, now I'm going to assume that it is cloudy. Uh, as it could not pinpoint, uh, essentially meaning that when it took the short exposure to try to check the stars against the catalog and really refine where we were looking, uh, it was not able to get a good reading, meaning it's probably a little cloudy in this area. Oh, never mind. We're fine. It's right in the center. And so here we have a really cool cigar galaxy. And before we take a closer look, we're going to go and we're just going to go and find the next one already. I'm surprised that 10 second exposure. And so go ahead and plot because better safe than sorry.
and this one is perfect as well. So we're gonna move the telescope there. And here we have the Cigar Galaxy. Now, a cool thing, as you can notice, is we don't have a big spirally shape. Because this galaxy, we're looking at edge on. And when you compare kind of the width and then the thickness of a galaxy, galaxies are vastly more uh, spread out and wide than they are thick. So when you look at them edge on, you kind of just end up with what looks like a, a narrow streak in the sky, like how you're seeing this here. And now it's not actually perfectly symmetrical. And if you look kind of closer in the center, you can see there's some darker areas in here. Uh, in different parts of this galaxy, there are going to be thicker areas where there is more star formation. So where there's a bunch of areas of uh, gas and dust that are thicker. And so the light's not able to kind of escape as easily, making those spots look darker. All right, we're still waiting to point. So now we've talked about grand spirals, like the pinwheel here. Of course, the whirlpool. Probably my favorite grand spiral out there. But these are not the only types of galaxies. I'm sorry, one sec. What was that, Katya? Yes, Katya is making sure that I point out that the Whirlpool is not actually just one, but two merging galaxies. And she is very right, saying it's kind of one galaxy isn't totally accurate. Uh, and that's kind of the coolest thing about the Whirlpool, so why not mention that both of them are merging like that? Uh, a fun word for this. Now, this one isn't a great example of this, as it's never actually going to fully envelop this one, as it will... Uh, they will merge, but they will actually continue orbiting around and going passing through the rings. Uh, but sometimes when one galaxy kind of absorbs another one and rips all of the material off of it, that is called galactic cannibalism, which is just kind of a fun, cool term. So we've looked at these spirals as kind of face on, looking at them from the top or the bottom. In space, top, bottom doesn't really difference and we've also now looked at them from the side looking at the cigar galaxy but there are other types of galaxies out there this next galaxy that we're going to look at is what's called an elliptical galaxy so these are typically and katia will correct me in a second if i'm wrong these are typically older galaxies that don't have that same uh structure as grand spiral galaxies We are getting close. M87, I believe, is a bit of a move to go through the sky. I don't believe it's very close to the other one. Oh, it's not too far. So I'm looking over in the planet and oh, it pointed. Oh, and it successfully pinpointed. And so we'll get our image quick. Now this one, as I mentioned before, uh, Leo and Virgo, which are very high up in the sky, this one is basically right between those two. And then that picture. Uh, 
One thing with elliptical galaxies is when you take images, they're usually not quite as uh, breathtaking as spirals, but they are still very cool in their own right. Little bit longer and this one through wow okay uh so one other really cool reason that i wanted to bring up this galaxy is last may this galaxy was in the news for a little bit because we got the first ever image of a of the accretion disk of a black hole. And I know because I have somebody in my ear that was gonna correct me if I got that wrong. And uh, back in May, we were able to get that very first image. And Katya, if you wouldn't mind bringing up that image and putting it into Slack. Katya was already ahead of me. So she's bringing that up now. It was the really cool groundbreaking image that they were able to put out that took tons and tons of data and work using multiple telescopes. And so with this galaxy, which we are about to see, as you can see, that is the entirety of that galaxy. And so as you can see, elliptical kind of makes sense for the name for these types of galaxies. So what you're looking at right now is a galaxy that is about 53 million light years from Earth. And this is a pretty big galaxy as there are a trillion stars in that tiny little oval that we're looking at there on the screen. And here we go. This was actually the image of the accretion disk from the the black hole and the first ever image we were able to get of something like this. Uh, black holes uh, don't let light escape. The gravity is so strong that the, when the light tries to leave, it actually is curved back around and comes back in. So trying to image black holes doesn't work because they don't let any light leave. The only type of light that can get out is when they have the uh, X-ray emissions, on the, from, uh, usually from the two poles. And so we're able to kind of image those emissions coming out of a black hole, but the black hole itself does definitely does not let any visible light out, hence its name a black hole. But we were able to get something like this where you can actually see some of the material around black hole. So we have had spiral galaxies, uh, elliptical galaxies, and there is one more type that we're gonna try to take a look at, see if it'll find C20. Let me just go look up NGC. I got it. NGC 4449. Oh, I Not even that late in the night yet. All right, we're going to plot it. Wow, it's very high. All right, and we're going to pinpoint and move there. So the third type of galaxy, and there are a bunch of other kind of subtypes, but the other main one is irregular. Uh, these can be caused for uh, multiple different reasons. 
one like a galaxy got ripped apart or merged with another one that was similar in size so they kind of lost all of their structure and just became one big soup of a galaxy and sometimes we don't know why they're irregularly shaped uh, so when you have kind of a bunch of galaxies that don't really fit a pattern you kind of have to have an umbrella to put them under but we just call them irregular because astronomers are not always creative Now, as we go there, we're actually not very moving very far in the sky. We're actually moving quite a bit closer back to towards Ursa Major. So this time of year is really good for looking at galaxies. Uh, there's quite a few really good ones up. And when you have a telescope like this, uh, basically any galaxy up in the sky that uh, has a name is one that you can hit. And while we're pinpointing, I just want to mention one last time that I want to thank all of you guys for joining us tonight. Uh, if you liked what you saw here, uh, go to our website, you, you know, leave us a review on Google Business, uh, you can uh, donate to us through our website. Uh, if you even just want to just take this video and share it with your friends and invite them to the next live stream, we want to be able to start doing this at least once a week uh, because we think this is a really cool tool that we want to have we want as many people to have access to and be able to learn from as we can. Uh, so anything that you guys can do to help either get our name out there or contribute to us directly is greatly appreciated and we really love having you guys all here with us tonight. Now we are just going to have to be patient once again as astronomy requires. Oh, could not pinpoint. I bet you it's already there. I think it is clouds causing issues with Mars. So we're just going to start with a... Alright, so we're going to take an image of our last galaxy is C21 or NGC 4449, 4449, however you want to say that, which is an irregular. I figured this one. So this one's actually Ichi. It's near a Messier. So one interesting thing that kind of makes this galaxy uh, a little 
it, well, plenty different, is that it's what's called a starburst galaxy, as it has a much higher rate of star formation than other galaxies of its type, or uh, of its kind of structure. And it kind of comes in like kind of a bar shape, but has a bunch of areas where new stars are currently being born. Uh, one very cool comparison is that it's very similar in structure to our large Magellanic Cloud, which as I mentioned before, is one of the satellite galaxies that orbits around our Milky Way. And this one's actually relatively close to us. Yeah, so if there's anybody who is in the Southern Hemisphere watching, uh, which I believe there might be, uh, if you go out at night, you can actually find the Large Magellanic Cloud with the naked eye. And when you do find that, know that I am incredibly jealous of you. Katya is also reminding me that she is very jealous as well. So if you go out and you go look at the Large Magellanic Cloud with the naked eye, you'll have seen something with your eye that our uh, incredible professional astrophysicist has not. Right. We are very close now. And this show is now going on an hour and a half. So uh, obviously, as your host, I need to work on my time management skills when it comes to doing presentations. Oh. The tracking did not stick with us. Did it track on, Katya? Huh? Yes, so uh, the image that you're seeing right now is uh, one, one. We're going to try pinpointing. So uh, if you notice the streaks going across the screen, those are stars. So as you might have noticed in the other images when we looked and there were stars in the backgrounds of the galaxies, and if I scroll up, I can probably point out a couple to you. So here you have the galaxy in the center, and down around the edge, you can see the little white dots are those stars. Uh, well, that means that the telescope is tracking or moving along with the sky as the Earth is spinning. When the telescope suddenly decides it no longer wants to track, you can see how far through the field of view that one star will move uh, over the course of 60 seconds. As you can see, that line is almost half the width of the entire field of view. So when you're looking at such a small area of the sky, stopping, uh, uh, stopping and not moving for 60 seconds actually changes uh, by quite a, a bit what you're looking at. So here you're looking at what you would call a star trail. Uh, taking an exposure over the course of 60 seconds, you're still collecting the light from that star even as it's moving, but the camera doesn't know any better, so it just spits back and says, oh look, you have these white lines. What a great image I took. In reality, it's not a very helpful image. Um, star trails can be quite fun, especially if you take them over hours and hours. You can kind of make the really cool star trails that you, where you almost get like a full circle uh, that go around Polaris. There are some really cool ones if you go and look online. But we're going to try to repoint, and I'm going to listen to Katya this time and take a 10 second exposure. That way we have 50 seconds more to uh, fix this again. Uh, we did actually have something like this come up during our Messier Marathon, where every now and then we just kind of had to turn the tracking back on. Um, when you're working with stuff that's this cool, there's going to be hiccups. And so we just kind of kind of Trudge along and keep moving. Luckily, I'm pretty sure that uh, this won't be anything that's going to hold us back for too long. Successfully pinpointed. And here we go. 
for the last image of the night. There we go. So as you can see, this one does not look much like the others. But as you, there's kind of like little clumps all throughout it. And those are different little pockets of uh, intense star formation. As I mentioned that before, this is something where there's a bunch of new stars actively forming. And it's called a starburst galaxy due to that high rate of star formation in it. So this, and along with all of the other images, we'll be able to send to you if you get your email to me, uh, either through contact at Glass Education or sign up for our email list on the website and add that in as a note. Uh, otherwise, I want to thank all of you guys for joining us. We really appreciate it. Uh, we're very happy to have you guys all here with us tonight. And hopefully we can see you all, uh, hopefully next week or whenever the next time we do one of these, uh, we'll be posting any updates to Facebook, Twitter, and if you are on our uh, mailing list, you will get all of those updates then. Uh, but with that, uh, I'm Adam with Glass Education, and we're going to be signing off. So everybody have a great night and stay safe.